Thanks, most of you know me. Is this on okay? This is kind of a nice place. Uh, lots of room. Quiet. We can see the screen. Um, I figure this is my only chance, and this isn't just for pest management, but just acknowledgments overall. I think this is our third event for kind of encouraging fresh market strawberry production in Oregon or the Northwest. And I feel like we're developing a really good um, team or group network between BC, Oregon, and Washington because this isn't a, a, a huge market. It's not going to have production or process style resources to throw into it. So it, it does need to be developed late, uh, differently. And people are really willing. So uh, personally, I am very much still learning on, on pest management on this. It's also difficult to get to uh, many fields to get an idea of what's going on regionally. Um, so I, I've depended quite a bit on ES Crop Consult. Those folks up there have been doing this in BC. Pretty much the same thing we do is scouting and monitoring fields. Uh, Carolyn, Emily, and Heather. Tom Bowman up there has also been very willing. They also help me on the, the newsletter, the Small Fruit Update. So Tom's been great on that. Tom Walters up in um, Anacortes, uh, private consultant. Walters Ag Research has been great. Uh, we always kid about too many Toms. But Wendy, who you just heard from this morning, has been fantastic. What was that? We weren't kidding. <laughs> we should eliminate Tom's, or at least one or two of them. This way, um, Matt has been fantastic. Um, sometimes I wonder, he probably does too. Uh, with fresh market, you're competing with each other, so it's much more difficult to share information. And these are some of the barriers we're, we're getting around, and we couldn't ask for somebody at Matt's the chair of the Oregon Strawberry Commission. He's willing to have us out on his farm today. He's been sharing a lot of information. We can't say enough about Matt as far as supporting this program. Strawberry Commission, obviously, they have also supported this somewhat to their detriment. They only get their money from processed growers pretty much. So how we make this transition in resources is, is tricky. But they also have been supporting it. ODA should be there. They, they put money into this too. And actually this workout, workout this, this workshop uh, has been Laura's work. You know, I, she's done a fantastic job. If you got problems with it, see Laura. <laughs> Julie has also supported her a lot and uh, Jason. And our field scouts. Plus, I feel like I'm on uh, <coughs> get me a award too. They're going to break me off soon. Uh, Chad, Brian, Pat, Mary, Pat Moore, uh, up, in, up in Washington, uh, Michael Dawson, they've been great. And it really helps to have a propagator on board. And Charlie has been fantastic. And Lawson Canyon's here again today. Did I miss anyone in the room? There's, there's, there's a huge number, obviously, with pest management. And I need to limit this, and I wanted to limit it. Up in BC, they gave a presentation. They have basically five major pests with their crops. The, three, the four I've got listed, plus two spotted spider mites. And I think for day neutrals, we can talk forever about the regular ones. There's other presentations, but those are the five that I think are the major thing. Our spotted wing, ligus, thrips, two spot, and powdery mildew. Pretty much I'm going to cover the first three. 
And again, ask questions, please. I'll ask you questions. Um, as I said, I very much feel like I'm in the learning mode on this, especially in our region. Uh, there's a lot of experience here in the room, and the more we can share with each other on this type of thing, the better off I think we all can be. Um, certainly when it comes to WIGAS and thrifts in our area, most of all the rec written recommendations are all coming out of, uh, I think Washington's got some too, but mainly California. Uh, BC's got a production guide. Um, they differ. They differ from farm to farm, from field to field. Production guides are great guides, but how do we manage the individual fields? And that's where there's a lot of variability. Um, one, one of the main things, especially with thrips and uh, ligus, is you need to treat for them so much sooner than production actually comes on because they affect the fruit quality, certainly the lichus. Um, how, many, how many growers are here? Did you just raise your hands? Please speak up if you've got comments or you see something. Um, I think we can all learn together on these things. So insect dynamics, pest management, you guys all know this, it's pretty basic. It's not just one thing, the weather this year really threw off a lot of our cycles and where we would predict things would go. Once you start with insecticide applications, it's going to disrupt any natural controls you've got out there in general. Um, cultivars surrounding habitat, uh, the last five years, obviously, SWD regimes have been the primary driver, not necessarily in June bearing, but in, would you guys agree with that, the growers in the room? Um, In some ways, I'd like to get some comments. Tony, would you be, uh, what, what are you, before this season, let me go on to the next slide, actually. I think the next one. We, we've never seen spotted wings so early. Uh, Wendy took these photos up in Puyallo on May 26th. Did you guys see the same thing? Did you see problems? with SWD very early this year in strawberries? Not so much. Not so, Not much. so much, but I did spray. Yeah, so you were proactive. You were spraying they before were the state. They, they were there. Okay. Other growers? Did you see any SWD pressure? They'll, they'll tolerate a, a lower level. Yeah. So in some ways you can wait till you see them in some strawberry fields before you actually have to treat. Yeah. I, I think the high temperatures actually reduced the colonization. The pop, population didn't grow like it might have if the conditions were good for them. It wasn't good for them. Okay. Yeah, I agree. If it would have stayed mild, after this initial outbreak, if it, we would have stayed mild, yeah. it would have been a whole different story. Um, generally, before this year, I was steering people away from spraying for strawberries. And in most normal years, I think we can get by. And as you were saying, even when they do hit strawberries early, as long as you're watching, you can tolerate a few larvae, 
and then get on a treatment program. Different for pain barriers. And I don't know how much time I want to spend on this. I think most of you guys have seen the SWD stuff. Um, there's a lot of factors that affect SWD. Uh, the weather factors, there's a handout back there. If you want to, if people have questions on this, it's fine. We can take some time. Otherwise, I'd like to get to the ligus and thrips. Would you guys like me to go over some of this? I shouldn't ask that. Um, we're learning a whole lot more about how to manage and how to get around SWD. Uh, my main agenda is trying to get us away from calendar sprays. It's a really tough thing to do. Uh, but we're getting there. And the more you know about your individual field, especially with strawberries, you can tolerate a few of them coming in as long as you're keeping on track of it. And you can treat that. If you've got cane berries or fresh market shipping blueberries, you better be on a preventative program. Strawberries, <coughs> you guys might disagree with this, but the damage initially is not terrible and you can get on top of it. Later in the season, if you've got high pressure, that might not be the case. Any, any, any disagree with that? And I, I've done this so often on SWD. I, if you need information on SWD, it's available. Yeah, we can talk about it. Uh, we're, we're really big on... I mean, that's the third step there. Keep an eye on your fruit. As it's coming in, watch it. If you see bruised spots, break open some berries. They aren't that hard to swallow. Would you, would you agree, Wendy? Yeah. Even Wendy mentioned some of this. Um, Ligus can really do a number. If you guys have ligus issues, you guys haven't seen, well, you don't have date neutrals yet, do you? Okay. I, I really want to get a feel for how big a problem ligus is year in and year out in our areas. And personally, I haven't seen enough fields to say. Any other grower comments or field men on how much problems you've had with ligus? Ted, have you seen it in your in the fields? Part of the problem is, from a consultant point of view, if you want people to be safe, you put them on a spray program. And we need to learn where we don't need to, how much your field's, personal field's at risk, and how high that risk is. Uh, because the decision on these needs to be made very early. Well, and some neighboring fields too, like why this would be more attractive to other crops, and if those other crops are harvested, then why this moves in. So, yeah, with the weeds right. and other things, and that's on the program coming up. But, couple of shots of the adults, and these were actually in the neighboring fields from the strawberries and raspberries, and this is on corn. The nymph stage is the one you need to watch for early, probably when, when things start to flower. And you can see, I think Jason, you took that picture, right? You were pretty proud. You finally got the, the, the five spots. Or what you watch for. Uh, uh, you guys can see them. The 
and control weeds. Host. This all comes from the UC Davis IPM manual. Control of weed hosts in the winter. Monitoring for the appearance uh, on them when they start bloom about in the early spring. You really need to get to ligus nymphs before they cause significant damage because they're feeding on the flower. So damage was not going to show up until you actually start seeing the fruit. Uh, they've got to be time to kill the very earliest instars. There's, this is California. They've got a lot of uh, insecticide resistance, especially in the adults. And again, the bottom point, a lot of these sprays can cause flare-ups in mites. So you don't want to go on with them unless you really know you need them. If they get bad, you can see even the really small fruit that would be ripening in two, three weeks is affected. So it can take a field out of production for two or three weeks in the middle of the season. So it's nothing to play around with. Tom? Yeah? Question. So see occasionally fruit at various points in the season that looks like that. Should we always assume that that's ligus bug causing that? Would you like to answer that? <laughs> uh, no, there's other things that cause uh, cat facing, but monitor this small fruit as it's as you're seeing it too. If it's starting to show symptoms, you better be out there checking and getting on it as soon as you can, so that you don't have something like this going through. Actually, if you start seeing this and it is caused by lichus, you're going to have a long problem before you can grow off of it, basically. Uh, get to take things out for a while. But yes, there are other things that can cause this type of, of uh, damage. Cat facing, what else? Um, yeah. Cold. It's, it's a pretty distinct, if you see it consistently, it's pretty distinctive. Yeah. I guess I've always wondered on the kind you see a nice and symmetrical on the tip. Why is that so appealing to a lot of like I, I get it when it's oh. all around, but it just doesn't quite make sense to me when it's just on the tip that it's I mean I, I always try to figure out whether that can be environmental or like is when it's that symmetrical. I think it's when the I think that might be because the berry has just started forming. So then when it grows out it appears on that tip part and Others might be able to answer that a little bit better, but I think it's because the damage is happening so early. But isn't it the part that's affected where they feed? Mm -hmm. <coughs> yeah, obviously. Only on the tip. But then it grows outward. They allow the rest of the berry to, to develop. You would say it's more of a timing one. Mm -hmm. Well, now they're eating you at the blossom stage, exactly. right? Exactly. Right. Oh, yeah, 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 that's when it's happening. So if you look at a blossom, the length of that bug, it's convenient. You walk in, so you don't fall off the heel. You walk into the center of the center of the blossom, will start nibbling. Right. Yeah, but then it leaves it and goes to the next one and nibbles the same way. It doesn't damage the entire fruit. Um, I don't know. I'm sure there's an answer. Where's our, where is Lisa the horticulturist? <laughs> An entomologist. Well, we do need entomologists. So, ligus monitoring, and this is where I've got my troubles in some ways, is how do we make this economic? Uh, this is from ES Crop Consult, they're a their team. They usually walk next to the fields. Most strawberry fields are only three to ten acres that they're treating. 24 stops, uh, two flower clusters, four ligus, 48 ligus samples per field. Uh, I'll show you the chug in a second that they use. Um, and it does work well. 
here's the problem. Okay, you do all that. The, the threshold is one ligase new for 20 samples. It's a really, really low threshold. There, that, this is, again, no PC. Uh, often exceeded. Difficult to manage in day neutral fields because populations are above threshold a lot of times while you've got hearts going on. So she says what they do is sometimes spray a third of their field at a time so they can keep their harvest going. Um, it seems excessive to me to a certain extent. And I suspect that's why I want a much better feel for how spotty ligases in our area are damaged or whether this is field by field issue. So. Yeah. Four, five minutes. Sorry. Okay. If you guys have got information on how many ligases are showing up in various fields or damage, I'd be really interested in hearing about it. Thrips on the second one, um, they feed again on those blossoms, stigmas, and anthers. Uh, controls, not, this again is from California, saying it's usually not necessary because it isn't economic. I'll go through this fairly quickly. Um, consider treatment uh, when you, the populations reach 10 per blossom. Typical type damage like this. This is the size of thrips. Very, very tiny. And we started using these two this last season. It's the cutout milk jug, works really well for sampling. Again, they're saying when thrips reach 10, is it true? I mean, I always get driven crazy by simple threshold numbers. Things are more complicated than that, but it is at least something to go by. Uh, if we get hot, or we've had insecticide sprays that are disrupted natural systems, you'll be much more likely or vulnerable to this type of a problem. You're going to screw it up so it's going to be crazy. What is that? Left arrow. Bottom arrow is the left arrow. So the symptoms are, are described usually as like the bronzing of the fruits. It's or tricky. It's really shiny, but not in a glossy way. And then also, um, I noticed in those photos, I've seen it in the field where the achenes or the seeds turn reddish. Is that actually brownish, like what you're describing with the... And or... I, I've got some of the same question to you. This is what I'm getting, we're getting familiar with too, is I think there are heat symptoms that can show something similar. It can look somewhat much more subtle than some of these are showing. So it's tricky, but you can see it, it tends to make the seeds stand out. These guys are, are rasping, they got a rasping model part, so they're they're rasping on the uh, the surface, supposedly. Do you see it? Yeah, we see the damage, the bronzing and the, the seeds standing out are some of the major things. Okay. Even with the spray program for SWD? Uh, yeah, less so, but still does. I mean, I figure if we have a spray program, regular calendar spray program for SWD going on later season. These other pests should be managed. If they're getting through that type of a program, of a 10 day spray program, um, that's another thing we really need to look at. You're standing up on that. Okay. Just a quick shot. I'm not going to talk about these things right now because I'm out of time in any way. And uh, Albion tends to be resistant to powdery mildew. We haven't seen any so far. And those are all the guys we're killing off. I think that's it. Anybody have any questions for Tom? Talk to me.
you have to work with some of your growers especially. I really want to get a better feel for what's going on in our particular region. Thanks. All right.